So in this passage here we have you see a passage on map making. Uh, look how he starts the passage. He says that we will live in a world. Uh, you say understanding where you are in the world is a basic survival skill. And he talks about creation of maps, the cognitive maps of our surroundings. Now, cognition has to do with learning, with the intellect, with thinking, you see. In the olden times, in ancient times, you see, they were drawn on stone tablets, on papyrus. You see, papyrus is supposed to be a kind of uh, material which is prepared out of the stem of a plant. And now we have the computer screens. For the last hundred years or so, all maps have north at the top, the old maps. You see, north never appeared at the top. That is symbolic. In ancient times, for the obvious reason, they believe that it's an area of darkness. West is also very unlikely to be put at the top because west is where the sun disappears. The third paragraph, he says, confusingly, early Chinese maps seem to bug this trend. When you oppose something, a trend or a practice, that is called bucking. Why does he say buck this trend? Look how the paragraphs are connected. The second paragraph was connected with such, given such a long history. The third paragraph says buck this trend. Now what trend he's talking about? The trend he talked about in the second paragraph. And what was the trend? That you don't have north at the top. But the Chinese, you see, they opposed this. Chinese map, the emperor who lived in the north of the country was always put at the top of the map. Now, that has to do with the human arrangement, uh, the leader, the emperor at the top, and the subjects, the ordinary people at the bottom, looking at the emperor. In Chinese culture, the emperor looks south because it's where the winds come from. Given that each culture has a very different idea of who, what they should look up to, it's perhaps not surprising that there is a very little consistency in which way early maps pointed. Now, the ancient Egyptians, you see, at that time, the top of the world was east, the position of sunrise. You see, that is a natural phenomenon. And Islamic maps, you see, they favored south, he says, at the top, uh, because the early Muslim cultures were north of Mecca. And Christian maps, you see, put east at the top towards the Garden of Eden and with Jerusalem in the center. The drawing of the maps was based on religion. Now, when did they all reach a consensus saying that North, you see, should be at the top? And he says, uh, if you say that the European explorers, uh, they were navigating by the North Star, if that is the reason, uh, that can't hold. Why? Because, but Bruton argues that these early explorers didn't think of the world like that at all. When Columbus describes the world, it is in accordance with East being at the top. Columbus says he's going towards paradise, so his mentality is from a medieval Mappa Mundi. Ads brought in that at time, no one knows what they are doing and where they are going. So he leaves that, you see, at a loose end without assigning a reason. Look at the question. Which one of the following best describe what the passage is trying to do? The passage hasn't done anything. And how do we find out it hasn't done anything? Because the last sentence, he says, no one knows what they are doing and where they are going. There have been so many wrong notions about map making. And the uh, passage is trying to correct, you see, those wrong notions about the way maps are designed. Option two should be the correct answer. It corrects a misconception about the way maps are designed. The next question is, early maps did not put north at the top for all the following reasons except north was the source of darkness. They did not put it at the top. East and south were more important for religious reasons for some civilizations. So that is why north was not at the top. East was considered by some civilization to be a more positive direction. And north was not at the top. So only one reason that remains is south was favored by some emperors. So the correct answer should be number two. Now let's come to the third one. According to the passage, early Chinese maps placed north at the top because uh, that, that is quite obvious. We saw that here. 
with everyone his loyal subjects looking up towards him that is paragraph number 3 so the they wanted to show respect to the emperor the next one is it can infer from the passage that european explorers like columbus and magellan the last paragraph columbus says he is going towards paradise so his mentality is from a uh, what do you call medieval mapa uh, mundi and he says when columbus describes the world it is in accordance with east being at the top so used an eastward orientation for religious reasons you see i told you that that is it's based on religion they set the precedent for north up map no they didn't because it has not been yet decided you see navigated by the compass that is immaterial navigated with the help of early maps that is not the point the point is they used a eastward orientation the next one is which one of the following about the northern orientation of modern maps is asserted in the passage the biggest contributory factor was the understanding of the magnetic north this is not given in the passage the biggest contributory factor was the role of european explorers no the biggest contributory factor was the influence of christian maps that is the point in the passage about map making so that cannot be the contributory factor the biggest contributory factor is not stated in the passage that is the correct answer he has been pointed out he has rather ended the passage by saying we got we have got to remember said ads broughton that at the time uh, no one knows what what they are doing and where they are going and the last one the role of natural phenomena is influencing map making conventions is seen most clearly and that way you see the chinese were making use of natural phenomenon when they talk about the winds they would talk about the darkness but uh, he says at the at the beginning of the third paragraph confusingly they weren't clear about it only one uh, civilization was clear about it and that was the ancient egyptian times the top of the world was east the position of sunrise that is in paragraph number 3 they were clear about so Uh, the correct answer would be early egyptian maps now let us come to the next passage the impact of printed text and iphone he goes for a comparison uh, there was a time when there were there were no printing presses information was limited and information could not be disseminated it cannot be shared for the obvious reason because printing was unknown in ancient times he is trying to just point out what is the influence of the printed text and what is the influence of the iphone now if you look at the first paragraph uh, i use a smartphone to find my way through the cobblestone maze of geneva's old town in search of a handmade machine that changed the world more than any other invention he is looking for a printing press this was the internet of its day before the invention of the printing press it used to take four monks up to a year to produce a single book with the advance in mobile type in 15th century europe one press could crank out 3000 pages a day shows that information can be shared and disseminated you see without much problem now he says the second paragraph for long average people could travel to places that used to be unknown to them with maps then you had the dissemination of medical information how did these things happen now that people are using maps and you could get information uh, about uh, the doctors it all happened with the coming of the printing press quack is a charlatan a pretended doctor he is not a doctor but he pretends to be one so the printing press well, it had a very vital role to play it offered the prospect that tyrants would never be able to kill a book or suppress an idea printing press did away with the monopoly haughtiness of all these clerics and all these priests on the scripture otherwise when the, there wasn't a printing press whatever the priest said that was final you were not supposed to what you call possibly antagonize them or speak against them and later stirred by pamphlets from a version of that same press the american colonies rose up against the a king and gave birth to a nation so a question in the summer of this 10th anniversary of the iphone has the device and that it is perhaps the most revolution of all given us a single magnificent idea is comparing the two things the written word the printed word you see has gone a long way 
in advancing what do you call human kind sure you can say the iphone changed everything by putting the world's recorded knowledge in the palm of a hand it revolutionized work dining travel and socializing it made us more narcissistic what do you mean by narcissistic that is you occupied with yourself because with the coming of the iphone uh, people have you see retired you see unto themselves they don't bother you see when uh, even if uh, a guest is sitting by them and talking to them they don't bother they are more involved in that uh, phone and unleashed an army of awful trolls trolling has become common people have become impatient uh, and people are you see all the time fiddling with their iphones and people have no time to think or daydream paradox just says for all of that i am still waiting to see if the iphone can do what the printing press did for religion and democracy the geneva museum makes a strong case that the printing press opened more minds than anything else it's hard to imagine the french or american revolutions without those enlightened voices in print does the iphone perform such a function Not long after Steve Jobs introduced his iPhone, he said the bound book was probably headed for history's attic. But he says not so fast. After a period of rapid growth in e-books, something closer to the medium for Chaucer's volume has made a great comeback. The hope of the iPhone and the internet in general was that it would free people in close societies. But the failure of the Arab Spring and the continued suppression of ideas in North Korea, China, Iran has not bolted. the iphone is still young it has certainly been one of the most important world changing and successful products in history as apple ceo tim cook said but i am not sure if the world changed for the better with the iphone as it did with the printing press or merely changed now there is a difference the world changed and the world changed for the better with the printing press the world changed for the better with the iphone the world changed now what is the difference when you say that with the iphone the world changed that is people have you see uh, they have been cocooned they have become narcissistic they have become you see uh, self occupied they don't don't have time to mix up with people religion democracy they are misunderstood and in a few lines uh, they you see they try to troll they try to make statements uh, he says the printing press has been likened to the internet for which one of the following reasons obviously it enabled rapid access to the new information and the sharing of new ideas just as the internet you see these days gives you access to rap- information quickly and sharing of new ideas uh, that is how the printing press at that point the printing press can be compared to the internet the next question according to the passage the invention of the printing press did all of the following except promoted the spread of enlightened uh, what you call political views across countries yes it did gave people direct access to authentic medical information and religious texts you had that in the second paragraph shortened the time taken to produce books and pamphlets yes it did that enabled people to perform various tasks simultaneously no it didn't do that so that is the answer the next question is steve jobs predicted which one of the following with the introduction of the iphone people would switch from reading on the internet to reading on their iphones did he say that no people would lose interest in historical and traditional classics no the passage doesn't say that reading printed books would become a thing of the past that is the correct answer that is given in the last but one paragraph he said the bound book was probably headed for history's attic the next question is i am still waiting to see if the iphone can do what the prints, uh, printing press did for religion and democracy the author uses uh, which one of the following to indicate is uncertainty uncertainty about what the iphone whether the iphone would be doing the same thing or the iphone would be as effective as the printing press the rise of religious groups in many parts of the world no that cannot be the answer the expansion of in trolling and narcissism among users of the internet no that is not an uncertainty the uncertainty is the con- continued suppression of free speech in closed societies so the answer should be what you call number 
the author attributes the French and American revolutions to the invention of the printing press because why? And that's in the third paragraph. It's hard to imagine the French and American revolutions without those enlightened voices in print. So the answer should be what? The rapid spread of information exposed people to new ideas on freedom and democracy. Number two should be the answer. Maps enable people no. Maps have no mention in the passage. It encouraged religious freedom among the people by destroying the monopoly of religious freedom. That is one point that has been made about the advantages of the printing press. And it made available revolutionary strategies and opinions to the people. Uh, but he's talking about particularly the French and American revolution. And that, that is the answer is number two. The last question, he says, the main conclusion of the passage is that new technology has. Number one, some advantages, but these are outweighed by its disadvantages. Now, that is a very general statement because he hasn't pointed out many advantages, nor has he pointed out many disadvantages, though he points out some major disadvantages. He says, uh, has so far not proved as successful as the printing press in opening people's mind. That's correct. I mean, uh, that is the main points you want to make. Uh, so that is the correct answer number two and the other two being disappointing because it has changed society too rapidly. No, that cannot be the point. And the last one has been more wasteful. No, um, American malls, right? Uh, you know what a mall is, right? A mall is supposed to be a marketplace there. You've got a place to talk to, meet people. You've got quadrangles, sit there and relax. You've got so many things. The writer is trying to uh, communicate the point that with uh, the disappearance of malls, now what do you mean by disappearance of malls? Malls are still there, but then the crowd you see has thinned out. And why has the crowd thinned out? Because of the online companies. Uh, people buy things online. Uh, the malls have become more or less place of not haunted by many people now. It is quite sequestered. That's what he says here. Uh, in the first paragraph, he talks about the disaster that has occurred. You see that 8,600 stores would close and many more would close and retail outlets would close. And then many of the retail outlets have filed for bankruptcy there. Uh, suffering, you see, uh, from lack of funds. Now, if you go to the second paragraph, there has been a great setback for the jobs because uh, with the coming of uh, online retailers and online companies, they don't require so many people. Uh, there has been, uh, they have lost 4,48,000 jobs, a 25% decline. The third paragraph is the most important paragraph because that contains what the writer has in mind. But those are workplaces, not gathering places. The mall is both. The mall was a place where you could work and you could gather. People could buy, people could have a get together there in the sense you would meet many people there and they would chat and pass time. Now, with the coming of the online business, people had turned narcissistic. They have become more self-occupied. The mall was the home of the first jobs and blind dates, the place for many family photos and ear piercings. Now, what has happened is things have changed. And then he talks about, think of your mall you went to as a kid. Think of what all that perfume and fragrance the mall exuded. You just have memories of that. What is he trying to tell us is, previously, you see, buying and selling was more or less a family affair, you could say, a social gathering, you see. That's what he is actually lamenting. The last paragraph is important because in the last line, uh, he says that malls were built for patterns of social interaction that increasingly don't exist. Let's look at the questions. Uh, the central idea of this passage is, it should be number three, malls used to perform a social function that has been lost. He's actually talking about the social interactions that have been lost because of the disappearance of malls or the reduction in the number of malls. Uh, why does the author say in paragraph two, the next question, the massive distribution centers Amazon has opened across the country, often not too far from malls, the company helped shutter. He says this to highlight the irony of the situation. He's sounding ironical. You feel that we are advancing, we are progressing, 
but in fact in the name of progress what has happened is we have lost the social interaction in the name of progress small retailers and other retailers have shut down in the name of progress those people who were employed in these malls and retail shops they have been unemployed and that is the irony of the situation and that should be the answer the next question in paragraph 1 uh, the phrase real estate developers once stumbled over themselves to quote suggest they now to quote what quoting means wooing paying attention to that once upon a time the real estate developers were in competition to run those brand name anchor outlet but now they aren't any more interested okay uh, the first one is incorrect Uh, it doesn't mean court it doesn't mean the high court or the supreme court the third one malls are closing down because people have found alternative ways to shop so that is incorrect you see um, it's not the meaning isn't that that isn't the suggestion collaborated with one another to get brand name anchor outlets yes they did that but that they did it once in the past now they aren't doing so the answer is number 2 uh, the author calls the mall an ecosystem unto itself because the the last but one paragraph combination of community and commercial peddling everything you needed and everything you didn't it means that it was a commercial space as well as a gathering so that is the correct answer why does the author say that the mall has been america's public square the answer to this is malls were a great place for everyone to gather the author describes perfume clouds in the department stores in order to of course he is trying to evoke memories by painting a picture of the mall. the next passage he is talking about speciation speciation is a change in the characteristics of species uh, when they are isolated now you have butterflies in a group you see in plenty at one place now what happens is they ship some of those butterflies to some other place uh, in due course of time after years and years they'll find that those butterflies who were isolated they have developed different characteristics you see they have developed different uh, traits so this is a question of what you call natural selection as well as uh, speciation uh, natural selection actually refers to the ability you see of the of the species or the living being to adapt itself to its own circumstances and develop accordingly now we can come to the questions you see which of the following best sums up early and raven's argument in their classic 1969 paper uh, what was the 1969 paper that gene flow was not as predictable and as ubiquitous as mayer and his cohort meant they said no uh, so the answer is he says while a factor isolation was not important to speciation as natural selection and you can see that Uh, in the third line they they also asserted that isolation and gene flow were less important to evolutionary divergence than natural selection the next one all of the following statements are true according to the passage except number 1 number 3 and number 4 the statements are true according to the passage except number 2 the population bomb question dominant ideas about species diversity the author discusses mayer ehrlich and raven to demonstrate what causes of speciation are debated by scientists people at the beginning ernest mayer and his colleagues who said well the cause is uh, living together if you isolate then there would be different the other scientists said no it is a natural selection even if you live together it doesn't matter isolation is not an important factor there number 3 is the correct answer now if you say evolution is sensitive and controversial topic that is a very general statement that cannot be the answer ehrlich and raven's ideas about evolutionary divergence are widely accepted by scientists and say that anywhere in the passage and then um, checker spot but- butterflies offer the best example of ehrlich and raven's ideas about speciation that's not the important uh, point you see the author wants to make he's just giving an example of the checker spot butterfly the next passage is about olympics it's not so much about olympics as the income from olympics okay he's talking actually about the funding the earning uh, where what is the earning and what are the losses you see 
when uh, you have stadium and stadia you see constructed he's talking about all these things he says then what exactly is the earning for a country you see from such activity look at what he says here but the lion's share of this goes to the international o- olympics committee the national olympics committees and the international sports federation any economic benefit would have to flow from the value of the games as an advertisement for the city a new transportation and communication infrastructure that was created for the games or on the ongoing use of new facilities so uh, th- this is all about the whole passage and i think now we can uh, switch over to the questions now and he says here the central point in the first paragraph is that economic benefits of the olympic games long term economic return so the answer should be number 3 accrue to host cities if at all only in the long term uh, it cannot be are shared equally among the three organizing committees because he has already said that the lion share a major portion you see and then uh, if you say that accrue mostly through revenue from advertisement and ticket sales that is a point of contention okay are usually eroded by expenditure incurred by the host city that is the point that is trying to make here okay the next question sports facilities built for the olympics are not fully utilized after the games are over because uh, the answer is number 1 their scale and costs of operating them are large uh, that is the answer the author feels that the games place a burden on the host city for all of the following reasons except that the diverse scarce urban land that's correct they involve the demolition of residential structures he has mentioned that in the last paragraph also the finances used to fund the games could be better used for other purposes the last one is the answer the influx of visitors during the games places a huge strain on the urban infrastructure you have five sentences all of these sentences look as if they are general sentences but then there is a reference to what you call the western scholars working on the indian past and then there is reference to the traditions that they are not handed down unchanged but are invented the, the most general statement the argument that's going on uh, would have number 5 as the first sentence just as life has death as its opposite so is tradition by default the opposite of innovation life is opposed to death and the same way tradition is opposed to innovation they are opposite he has used the word innovation he has used the word tradition now look it is now a truism to say that traditions are not handed down unchanged but are invented a truism is a self statement you see which doesn't have much evidence you see so it is now a truism to say that traditions are not handed down unchanged but are invented and then if they are invented then they have got to be something novel the handing down has reference in number 1 the process of handing down implies not a passive trust but contestation in defining what exactly is to be handed down every ge- selects generation selects what it requires from the past and makes its innovation some more than others why do you think three should follow one i'll give you a reason for that you see the process of handing down implies not a passive transfer but some contestation in defining what exactly is to be handed down that is we have got to contest we have got to make a choice what is to be handed down you have got to make a selection you see what is to be handed down if it has to be contested selected and made a choice of then you have the point that every generation selects what it requires from the past and then some are important and some are Le- less important so you have 5 4 1 3 3 and the last one is 2 wherever western scholars have worked on the indian past the selection is even more apparent and the inventing of a tradition much more recognized so you have 5 4 1 3 2 that is the correct answer the next one scientists have for the first time managed now for the first time when you look at it it should strike your mind well he is talking about that first time maybe this could be the first sentence i mean you can keep it in mind the cardiac disease is causes sudden death now that is a statement doesn't have a context here it can't follow number 
one uh, correcting the mutation that cannot be the first sentence uh, it is caused what is caused we don't know in re- it's in results announced nature this week what results we are talking about we don't know so the first sentence should be number one and what happened after that in results announced in nature this week scientists fixed a mutation that thickens the heart muscle a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and then the cardiac disease causes sudden deaths in otherwise healthy young athletes and affects about one in 500 people over and then it is caused by a mutation in a particular called gene and a child will suffer from the condition even if it inherits only one copy of the mutated gene and then of course the last one is number three correcting the mutation so the answer should be one, five, two, four, three. And the next one, see, you can't begin with saying the study suggests. That means he has already talked about a study. You say the oldest sample came from sample of what? So number one, number two cannot be the first sentence. The ages of the skeletons correspond to a time of mass exodus. Now, what skeletons is he talking about? So that cannot be the first sentence. In the analysis of the fragments of DNA for sequences, now what analysis? So in in that sense, number five should be the first sentence. DNA from a Bronze Age human skeletons indicate that the Black Plague could have emerged as early as 3000 BCE long before the epidemic that swept through Europe in the mid 1300s. Now, they had analyzed the DNA from Bronze Age human skeleton. So number four should follow in the analysis of fragments of DNA from 101 Bronze Age skeleton. And after four, you have the analysis, the reference to the analysis in number one. The study suggests, what study? The analysis that they made here the bacterium that causes the disease, seven tested positive. And then you have number two, the oldest sample came from an individual who lived in Southeast Asia about 5,000 years ago. And then number three, uh, the ages of the skeletons correspond to a time of mass exodus from today's Russia. So the correct answer is five, four, one, two, three. The next one you can see here is the visual turn in social media has merely accentuated this announcing. This announcing, that, is, that means he has talked about something. The announcing instinct in a previous line. So that cannot be the first sentence. There is absolutely nothing new about us framing the vision of who we are. And then you have turning the pages of most family albums, which belong to a period well before the digital dissemination of self-created and self-curated moments and images, would reconfirm the basic instinct of documenting our presence in a particular space on a significant occasion with others who matter. Now, that is a very general sentence. Uh, The human instinct, the human desire to document everything you see uh, that he has lived in the past or in the present, why do they maintain? That is a desire, an instinct in all the people. So number three could be the first sentence. And after three, you come to number two. There is absolutely nothing new about us framing the vision of who we are and what we want virtually or otherwise in our Facebook page for exam. That is because he has talked about, you see, the dissemination of self-created, self-curated moments and images. And then you have the reference in number one to this visual term that he talks about in number two. Two, visually or otherwise. Four, you see, explains the point that he has made. We are empowered to book our faces and act as celebrities. And then the last one is five. What is unprecedented is not a desire to put out newsfeed related to the self, but the ease with which this broadcast operation can now be executed, often provoking unanticipated responses from beyond one's immediate location. So it should be three, two, one, four, five. Now, you have a question in 29. What does a classic mean uh, to him? You see, classic may have a different dictionary, uh, dictionary definition. We are not worried about that. 
uh, he is talking about what classic means to him. He says it means precisely the opposite of what my predecessors understood. A work is classical by reason of its resistance to contemporaneity and supposed universality by reason of its capacity to indicate human particularity and difference in that ep past epoch. Epoch means the age, the past era. The classic is not what tells me about shared humanity, but what nourishes in me the illusion that everything has been like me and has existed only to prepare the way for me. So the classic is a transition. Instead, the classic is what gives access to radically different forms of human consciousness for any given generation of readers and thereby expands for all of them the range of possibilities of what it means to be a human being. So uh, he is, you see, talking about what the classic is, he doesn't want to go into the old definition or the definition by default, you see. Uh, it's different because it should give him different forms of human consciousness. It should go beyond the universal. It should go beyond the local. It should examine, you see, the stature of the human being. So in that sense, the correct answer would be number three. A classic is a work exploring the new going beyond the universal, the contemporary, and the notion of a unified human consciousness. If you look at the, at the other option, you will find that they are lacking in one thing or the other. They don't encapsulate what is stated in the passage. For example, you look at number one, a classic is able to focus on contemporary human condition and a unified experience of human uh, consciousness. But uh, he, now here he has left out the universality, you see, it's going beyond the universal. A classical work seeks to resist particularity and temporal difference even as it focuses on a common... That is the point uh, he's against, you see. A classic is a work that provides access to a universal experience of the human race as opposed to radically different forms of human consciousness. No. In fact, he's more interested, you see, uh, in the different forms of human consciousness. If you come to the next one, he's talking about translation here. And it uh, says that uh, the, the European translators, you see, since they don't have a very good idea of the Indian culture, uh, they might face a problem, you see, in translation. Whereas Indians, you see, they don't face a problem in translating Indian text into English because they, they are aware of their own culture. Uh, so now that is about the whole thing. So the correct option here would be number three, Indian translators should translate Indian text into English as their work is likely like to pose cultural problems which are harder to address than the quality of language. While translating the Indian and the Westerner face the same challenges. No, they don't face the same challenges. As preserving cultural meanings is the essence of literary translation, Indian's knowledge of the local culture outweighs the initial disadvantage of lower fluency in English. That is not the point he is talking about. You see, it's not the question of whether you know the language well or how well you can translate. It's a question of what you call uh, translating uh, the text into English, keeping in mind uh, the cultural problems. Westerners might be good at gaining reasonable fluency, but as understanding the culture, reflect, uh, no, Indians remain. That is not the point. The point is talking about translation. Next question is uh, passage. He's talking about global warming. He's talking about, you see, the storm. And the he says the storm surge was greater because sea levels have risen 20 centimeters as a result of more than 100 years of human related global warming, which has melted glaciers and thermally expanded the volume of sea. The whole thing has been summed up in the last three lines. So therefore, your answer should be number three that global warming melts glaciers, resulting in seawater volume expansion. This enables more water vapor to fill the air above faster, thus modern storms contain more destructive air. The other options are, are incomplete. The storm Harvey is one of the regular annual ones from the Gulf of Mexico. Global warming and Harvey are unrelated phenomena. It doesn't, uh, you see, state anything. If you look at number two and four, uh, you'll find the same thing. The next one, he's talking about people who study, you see, children's languages, spend a lot of time watching how babies react to the speech they hear around them. They make films of adults and babies interacting and examine them very carefully to see whether the babies show any signs of understanding what the adults say. They believe that babies begin to react to language from the very next moment they are born. Sometimes the set signs are very subtle, slight movements of the baby's eyes or the head of the hands. He's talking about the film. You see, people who are interested in studying children's language what they do is uh, they spend a lot of time watching how babies react to speech and how what they hear around them. 
and uh, you see because all the time they can they cannot watch babies so what they do is they start making films of some babies and then uh, they keep on you see looking at the uh, film again and again you would never notice them if you were just sitting with the child but by watching a recording you see watching a recording so the whole thing is about you see a recording a recorded film so the only thing that uh, stands out as odd is number 3 they believe that babies begin to react to language from the very moment they are born uh, now let's look at the next one neuroscientists have just begun studying exercises impact with brain cells on the genes themselves okay uh even there in the roots of our biology they have found signs of the body's influence on the mind okay it turns out that moving our muscles produces proteins that travel to the blood stream that is when you do an exercise you see they it has an in, a, impact on your brain cells when the movement of the muscles you see they might produce what you call uh, proteins that travel through the br- blood stream into the brain and then in today's technology driven plasma screen in world it's easy to forget that we are born movers animals in fact because we were engineered movement movement right out of our lives it's only in the past few years that neuroscientists have begun to describe these factors and how they work and each new discovery adds or inspiring depth to the picture so you see if you look at care, read it carefully you can see it's talking about all about the brain Uh, the cells the muscles the exercise so number 4 you see doesn't talk of any of these things number 4 you see in today's world technologically driven world plasma screened in world it's easy to forget that we are born movers animals in fact because we have engineered movement right out of our lives uh, in the last one you can see that Uh, the water that made up ancient lakes and perhaps an ocean was lost uh, particles from the sun collided with molecules in the atmosphere knocking them into space or giving them an electric charge that caused them to be swept away by the solar wind he's talking about what he called the planets most of the planets remaining water is now maybe he's talking about mars isn't it uh, that the planets remaining water is frozen or buried right Uh, data from nasa's maven orbiter show that solar storm stripped away most of mars once thick atmosphere he or she is restricting himself to mars and to the sun uh, that means uh, to the planets a recent study reveals how mars lost much of its early water while another indicates that some liquid water so everything number 2 3 4 5 has to do with what you call mars and of course number 2 has to do with the sun so the odd one out is the water that made up ancient lakes and perhaps an ocean was lost that, that doesn't fit anywhere you see in the cluster number 1 is the odd one out